Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, uh, Catherine McKenna, a distinguished cl uh, global climate leader, is an adjunct senior research scholar at the climate, <clears throat> Columbia Climate School, advising on range of topics including climate law and finance and her initiative, Women Leading on Climate. Um, Catherine is, uh, as everyone knows here, is Canada's former Minister of Environment and Climate Change as well as Minister of Infrastructure. She chaired the UN Secretary General's new high-level expert group on, not, on net zero commitments of non-state entities released at COP27 in Egypt in 2022, setting out criteria for, not, not for net zero commitments of business, financial institutions, cities, and regions. She is an advisor to the Climate <clears throat> Data Steering Committee for the Macron Bloomberg Net Zero Data Public Utility, to Singapore's International Advisory Panel for Carbon Credits, to the Energy Transition Accelerator, as well as as to the University of Ottawa's Information Integrity Lab. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Catherine McKenna. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's super awesome being here. Um, it's kind of funny because normally I come uh, to New York at this time of year and I'm like, oh my God, it's like 10 degrees warmer than Canada. But sadly in Ottawa, which is normally very cold, there's not even any snow in our canal. It did open, but for four days, if you're planning on coming, there's no skating left. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm very happy to be affiliated with the uh, Climate School, um, and it's just a really great place. And I meet lots of great students. I'm at Kasha. Where's Kasha? Kasha's right there. She was telling me about a great initiative um, that, uh, well, yes, Denmark did first, and Poland did, which was to have a, a climate uh, youth council actually integrated in making decisions. So I always find out interesting ideas um, about what we need to do to actually get more ambitious action. So um, I'm going to speak uh, until around 3.15. Um, sometimes I'll speak really fast. I'm kind of Irish, I'm Irish background, so I'm going to go a little fast because I got a lot of slides. And then it's open to you guys for questions. Okay, well, I said, you know, I'm going to talk about the Paris Agreement, my life in politics, so there I am. That's basically how I started, you know, just graduated from high school, went to university, and then was Minister of Environment and Climate Change. <laughs> no, that's not what happened. And I do this with students. I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story. Everyone has a story, but I think it's important because I remember when I was young, I would go to these talks and I'd say, how the hell did they get there? Like, I don't even get it. I did not know <laughs> that I would one day be Minister of Environment and Climate Change. That was not a plan, um, it was amazing, but everyone is gonna have a different journey and I want you to feel like you can do it too. Whatever it is that you wanna do, it won't be a linear path, by the way. You may have like partners that live abroad, you may have aging parents, you may get crappy jobs because there are no jobs, you may end up in weird places or doing weird things, you may take a year off. It's fine, it's fine, you will be okay. You are here at Columbia Climate School. Uh, you obviously are smart, uh, you've got some chutzpah, so you can also do uh, cool things too. So there is me, um, that's, I was the eldest of four kids, so I'm quite bossy. Um, it's my mom, that's my dad, sadly he passed away, he's Irish, he passed away last year. Um, uh, he's Irish, so that's important because, you know, when I'm fighting climate change, and if anyone, if you paid any attention, anyone Canadian here? Okay, well, you might have seen some days it wasn't awesome for me, um, social media. I, I had like a good group of haters. I had people who loved me, it was fine, but I also had people who didn't love me, and unfortunately some of the stuff online went offline. But then I was like, is it really that bad? Well, this is my grandfather, he fought for Irish independence. So when days are hard, I was like, I can do it too. So that actually was inspiring to me, and you probably have some stories like that too. They keep you going when days are hard. This is the hammer, Hamilton. Hamilton is kind of like Detroit. If you look in the, down the street, like this is kind of where I lived over here. You look straight down, what do you see? <laughs> you see a factory. <laughs> if you are from Toronto, anyone here from Toronto? We didn't love people from Toronto because they'd be like, oh, Hamilton, oh, so polluted. Well, you know what? When you're Hamilton, you keep it real. Um, and Hamilton is actually uh, a steel town. 
Um, it's actually a little bit like Detroit, and it's cleaning up, um, and there's a really great story. But coming from the hammer, you realize you gotta be a real person, and you can't talk like an alien, which is actually what climate people often do, so don't be a climate person that talks like an alien. You gotta be real, and you have to always think about people, which is also part of my story into politics. But really, what did I wanna do when I grew up? I didn't care about politics. I wanted to go to the Olympics. Um, and uh, if you're not a swimmer, probably, even if you're Canadian and you guys are very young, um, that was the Canadian gold medal, medal Olympic team, and I just thought they were amazing. That's 1984, so I'm dating me because that was on my wall, so I was 13 years old, um, and that's all I dreamed about. But being a swimmer is quite good, because what do you have to do if you're a swimmer? Any swimmers here? Nice, okay, well, <laughs> Brad, are you a swimmer? <laughs> you like swimming, I don't know, were you a competitive swimmer? That was okay, triathlete, okay, so same thing. Any athletes or people who just work hard, do you know that like, you can have a long-term goal, you wanna go to the Olympics, but if you sit on your couch and just eat candies every day, you're not going. Um, that you gotta get up, you gotta work really hard, you gotta go on the blocks, and you gotta see how you do, and if you don't do well enough, you're gonna have to work harder. And I think that also, very important lesson um, in life, so now I'm really fast forwarding. Maybe I'll go to this one. So this is a picture of everything I did. <laughs> and you're gonna look, I think, maybe I don't have it there. I worked on a pub in, uh, in London. Uh, I taught swimming lessons to Tony Blair's, uh, does anyone remember Tony Blair? Uh, to Tony Blair's child uh, when I was at LSE. Uh, I worked for the Department of Foreign Affairs. I worked for UN Peacekeeping Mission. I even worked for the G7 Research Group where we pretended we were like journalists and went to a G7 meeting and we got to see Bill Clinton. It was extremely exciting. Um, I went to U of T, I lived in Indonesia. This is all what life really looks like. So you heard a bit about my CV. That is like in retrospect. You can tell a very nice story about you know, people, about how fancy they were, and they did all these things, it was all organized. So if you're thinking, well wait, I better plan my whole life out, good luck. You cannot plan your life out, and if you do that, you will miss out on a lot of opportunities. To finish my story about getting into politics, so I did a number of things. Um, I, when I was, I lived in Indonesia, uh, worked as a lawyer there, and then worked for UN Peacekeeping Mission in East Timor. East Timor voted for independence. Uh, kind of all hell broke loose, and we were helping to work with the East Timorese to build their country. I came back to Canada, started a charity called Canadian Lawyers Abroad, and then we decided, well, we were pushed by one of my mentors who said, why aren't you doing work in Canada with Indigenous peoples? Like, why are you so focused on third world conditions when we have third world living conditions um, with Indigenous people? So I was like, oh, that is right. So I started this organization with a friend, so you can also do this. We started a charity called, it was Canadian Lawyers Abroad, it became Level Justice, Leveling the Playing Field for Justice, and this is with indigenous young people. We did a program called Dare to Dream, which was to help these young people dream about being part of the legal system, whether it was a lawyer, or a court worker, or whatever, a judge, it was about putting it in a more positive frame. This is relevant because we then got a government that was terrible, so, may happen to you guys sometimes, I'm not saying anything, hopefully not, but uh, I was really unhappy, because I had worked uh, in government, I had worked uh, in the private sector, and then I was working with a charity, and I realized actually, change would not happen until, unless people stepped up and went into politics. And the government was very against reconciliation with indigenous peoples. It was not into Canada's <laughs> Canada, it was role in the world, um, and it didn't care about climate. And these were things that were really important to me. So that is why I stepped up into politics. And I want you to consider that. There was nothing like, I left politics because I wanted, I was like, peace out, I'm gonna work on climate internationally, I have kids, I wanna spend time with them. But I do want you to all consider politics. We need good people wherever you live to consider going into politics. It is not easy, but it's extremely important. Anyway, there, I did have three kids. That also was my reason for going into politics, which you might be like, that's counterintuitive because having three kids is a lot of kids. Um, and going into politics while you have three kids is a lot of kids. But it also made it seem really consequential. Like, what was I doing with my life? Like was I really, I was doing corporate law for a while, I was like, kill me now, like I just making money, but I don't, I don't even, I want these deals to, to, to die. I was, a, I was an antitrust lawyer, which actually randomly became helpful later in life, but uh, I really decided it was important to get a change in government. 
I wore uh, many pairs of running shoes, uh, because if you want to go into politics, you have to knock on a lot of doors. We knocked on more than 100,000 doors, the most doors in the country. Uh, I had a very, very hard riding uh, to win, but we won. It is me with Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister, when he asked me to be Minister of Environment and Climate Change. So let me, if I go back to the very start, where I was like a little kid, I was not planning that moment in time. It happened, um, and there we are. Uh, what you will notice is a gender balanced cabinet, which was quite good because then I was like, it's done. We don't have to say, can we find women? Like the women were there. We were half the cabinet and hopefully that sets a precedent for other governments. And that's how I got to this point. So this will tell you, you will have your own journey in life. Some days it'll seem like you're never gonna be able to get out of where you are. You will, you will, you just have to persist and draw on those things that you, you know, as a, when you were young, they, you know, got you inspired. All right, two, the Paris Agreement. So kind of hilariously, I became Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and then the Prime Minister tells me that, so I almost fall off my chair. I'm like, whoa, okay, all those climate people. I care about climate change. I don't know everything about climate change. And then he said, and you're going to COP21 in three days. So I was like, okay. So then I had to ask um, my deputy minister, the most senior public servant in my department, I had to say, what's a COP? I was like, no dumb questions. And then he said, conference of the parties. And I was like, wow, that's really useless. And then I said, no acronyms. But that is me uh, a few days later. I studied really hard, but I didn't know all the ins about climate. I just didn't. I cared about climate change. I'd worked as a human rights lawyer. I'd done a bunch of things, um, uh, but I didn't know everything. Um, I did know, though, we need an ambitious agreement. And so I got down to work to help. Unfortunately, this is supposed to come up like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So just like try to stay with me. I know it's very hard. You're like, I'm going to go to the tenth one. Um, so what are the lessons from COP21? And I think it's important because sometimes we breeze by the Paris Agreement and we're like, yeah, yeah, the Paris Agreement. And then some people are like, oh, well, it's not even doing anything. Actually, the Paris Agreement is really, really, really important. Uh, it was the first time that the world came together to have an agreement with a clear temperature goal um, and where every country recognized they needed to do their part. Is it binding? No. Like, these are international treaties, but it is extremely important as a framework. So I think it's important because you guys probably care about international relations, and this was actually a, an amazing case study in how to get a deal um, for many reasons. And because we're coming up in the 10th anniversary, which is quite hard to believe next year, it's important to kind of think about, okay, how do we get an ambitious deal? Sometimes the cops these times are depressing, I will say myself, but that was not a depressing cop. Um, one, preparation and leadership matters. So the, the French government worked for years ahead of time, and I, I, a good friend of mine I met later on um, as, the Canadian, as the French ambassador to Canada, she said like they were grilled. Did you, she was the ambassador to Brazil, and like they would have like a Socratic method, which with Laurent Fabius, the foreign minister, what did you do in your country? What did they say? What is their position on this tiny like random issue? And so they did a lot of prep work. Um, and they showed leadership. What is leadership? They realized that the role wasn't to advance France's interests, it was, in, it was to advance the world's interests for an ambitious agreement. That is not always necessarily, to be honest, what we see at COP. Sometimes there's confusion between what countries are supposed to do if you're the COP head and getting great announcements, as opposed to you are supposed to be leading the world on ambition, not mediocrity, ambition. Two. Woman kicked it on climate. I'll send you a picture, show you a picture later, but it was really quite awesome. It was something that I was just like, wait, why are all these awesome women here? And it's almost International Women's Day, so happy International Women's Day to all the women and everyone else. Please celebrate uh, the, the women who are here, probably working really hard on climate, so are people of diverse genders, men, but still, I think women have played a really important role on climate. You had uh, Christiana Figueres, who was head of the COP. Uh, you had Laurence Tubiena, who was the uh, French climate ambassador. But then you had Mary Robinson. I don't know if anyone knows her. She was the president of Ireland, the head of the UN um, Commission on Human Rights, and she is a climate and justice advocate. So really bringing in the justice aspect of climate. Um, you had Sharon Burroughs. She represented labor. We need to have labor there. We had a, a bunch of ministers, including me, who were responsible for negotiating particular pieces. Um, but we had women across the board really pushing ambition. And as I think about transformational change, I think we have to 
think about it in non-linear ways, like actually helping women um, push the ambition, because often only 10% of leaders are women, um, but often women are leading the way, and we need those voices to really push harder and think about more <laughs> innovative ways to advance climate action. Leaders attending at the start was smart. I'm very nerdy, so I'm telling you actually things that I think are really important. So sometimes at COPS, what they do, or at, at international um, events, they invite leaders at the very end to celebrate. Well, they brought the leaders in the beginning, and what the leaders basically said is we need an ambitious agreement. So then they left, and then they had to deliver. And the problem with climate negotiations is very sadly, often negotiators just restate positions or go backwards. <laughs> so here they were given direct orders. You better get a deal. Um, we expect you to get a deal. When you come back home, I will be holding you to that. Uh, Indabas made a difference. So Indabas were, um, they're a meeting, um, it is, who can tell me, Indaba is, is it an African, I'm trying to think where it's, who's gonna win on this one? Zulu, thank you, okay, you win, okay. You're also my friend, so it looks like it was like fixes in, but it, um, Indabas were, uh, they were something that, we, that was decided on that they would bring everyone around the table and everyone got to make their point. Now that is obviously what you do at climate conferences anyway because it's the whole world there, but there was a lot of focus on everyone being able to state their position. That was kind of annoying to be honest, I'll tell you. Like when you're at 3 a.m. and everyone's kind of restating or going backwards and you're like, oh my God, it's so freezing cold here and there's not even baguettes to eat. Like it was hard. But maybe that was the point. The point was we all had to sit there and listen to everyone else. Um, the High Ambition Coalition became cool. So the High Ambition Coalition uh, was actually by a country that is not the biggest player in the world, the Marshall Islands. Um, and they made the point that actually they would be underwater if we didn't agree to 1.5 degrees. And what was interesting with the High Ambition Coalition is they created it and then I came, like countries were like, oh shoot, I wanna be part of that. And they were like, hmm, I don't know. And so then they would really push you on whether you could be part of it. Australia was not allowed to be part. A lot of countries were not invited. And so people wanted it. And I think that is actually important as we think about climate action now that we need high ambition coalitions. Because I will tell you, they're like the low ambition coalition is alive and well. We need to be working with the high ambition folks to jam the low ambition folks. Um, <clears throat> Sessions devoted to tough issues created breakthroughs. So what they did, um, there were a number of hard issues. I was Article 6, market tax, assigned that. Um, we were just given breakout sessions. And it was actually better because you could get into real discussions. I actually, my, my mode of operating was actually to leave the folks in the room. So it was a smaller group of negotiators. And I remember I was like, okay, they need some time because otherwise we're all just gonna sit around and say the same thing over and over, the same fights. So we left and I came back at one point and then we had like the Irish negotiator on a table, like screaming and it was, I was like, yeah, we're making some progress here. So that was very smart. Transparency, yes, but ultimately Fran held the pen. Ultimately, someone has to show leadership. It was important that in you, these climate negotiations, if you go, there are drafts. And when you put out drafts, if everyone's surprised or one side's surprised, like it's generally, unfortunately, it often is, you have developing countries and developed countries. That is not exactly how it works, but sometimes it is like that. Depending on where the draft lands, like they will be angry, you know, angry people. Generally, that always happens. But you have, so you have to manage drafts. It's very, very strategic about how far you push in each draft. But in the end, France was like, okay, and here's the final text, boom. Now, was anyone there? Did anyone hear about it? it was, there is a funny side story. I was just with one of the negotiators from the US, the should, shall issue. Does anyone know the should, shall issue? The should, oh, we have, we do. We have someone who knows the should, shall. Well, the should, shall issue is kind of a funny issue. So we're at the final session, like we're all waiting for the, you know, the gavel to go down and say that we got an agreement. And I'm sitting there, and remember, we've only been, Canada's got a new government for like two weeks. And uh, it was really three weeks then. And so I hear the Americans behind us. I can't believe it, oh shit. I was like, what, what? So I turn around and they're like, should. I was like, they put a should instead of a shall? <laughs> I think that's right. Like shall isn't binding and you don't have to get approval of, 
It's the opposite. Okay, I don't even know. I'm a lawyer, and I was like, what? I was like, no, they put the wrong words. So, whatever happened, the Americans were like, mm, can't do it. Can't have a shall instead of a should. Okay, can't have a shot. Like this is how absurd it is. So we've done all these negotiations all the times, and the Americans are like, we can't sign. I was like, are you? Joking. So there I am on the phone calling, like, you know, the prime minister's office. I was like, what if the Americans don't sign? They're like, we can't sign. I was like, no. <laughs> so anyway, then it all hell breaks loose. So quietly, you see John Kerry kind of walking over to Minister Xia, who is the Chinese negotiator. And then everyone's kind of like, what's going on? And then you see kind of going up to the French, and then, then uh, Laurent Fabius, the foreign minister, looking very pale now, like, not good. And then kind of you see folks that didn't really want to deal, like Nicaragua kind of getting into it. And then suddenly it was all going off the rails. Because if you get a deal, it all has to be, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So we're like, oh my God, how is this going to pan out? Like we've all been negotiating for so many days. The world is watching. And no one, like the media doesn't quite know what's going on, but it's just taking a really long time. And so someone called the Pope, because Nicaragua, the president, was very close to the Pope. But the problem was the Pope was a Friday, so he was giving Friday mass. So that was a problem, because he couldn't leave mass, obviously, to talk about, it. like, you know, the Paris Agreement should, shall issue. So anyway, somehow, this was the French. So it was quite brilliant. And, like, people don't tell enough funny stories in climate, so I think this story was just, like, quite awesome. So suddenly everyone sits down. Like, it all kind of, like, you know, whatever, sits down. And then you see Laurent Fabius. So he's the French foreign minister, and he's like kind of shaking. And he says, OK, we've got some just like discrepancies, just things we need to fix. And it's like the translation and line, whatever, because you have to translate these languages. This, and, this, and, this, and, this. and then they're like, OK, we're going to gavel it down. And you see, I think it was Nicaragua putting their hand up. And, it's, 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 it's consensus, not unanimity. So you see, he's like gavels it down and then everyone erupts, probably even in Nicaragua and the deal was done. But the thing about that, I tell you that story because it is kind of a hilarious story and if you were there, it was totally bonkers. I was like, is this deal really gonna go down over an American, you know, it's kind of like a Congress or maybe it's, I don't know who you gotta get. Like, like everyone's like, oh my God, the Americans. But, uh, it was important because it showed leadership. And I think on climate, sometimes you have to gavel it down. <laughs> like sometimes you have to say, I'm sorry, not every, we have heard all from you, but you're all not gonna be able, like you're not gonna be able to ruin this, we're just gonna do it. Um, okay, uh, subnational, so like cities, regions, environmental groups, civil society, business, all of those folks actually were essential. I don't love that COPs have now become like, it's like a trade fair, but at that point, the pressure that was being put on by high ambition folks outside of the negotiating room was actually super, super important. Um, ultimately, and this is what one always hopes, <laughs> hopes happens in, in multila uh, multilateral negotiations. Every country decides it's better to be in than to be out. And that, it was unclear whether we were going to get an ambitious agreement. I think people thought we would get an agreement, but was it going to be ambitious? And the most important thing is actually multi multilateralism matters. I think we can all be cynical about multilateralism, and it's certainly not perfect, but everyone trying to go, on it, go at it alone on a problem like climate change, where pollution doesn't know any borders, very key. So we cannot lose faith in that, and we have to remember that not one country can stop climate change, just saying, um, including this election. Okay. That was, I don't know, that's just a nice picture. This is the picture, uh, there's me, I'm like new minister, I look so young then and happy, you know, I should have maybe resigned then, it was like amazing. Um, with, but what's interesting there is we brought a delegation that included leaders of the opposition, included conservatives, who you could hardly imagine that right now, the new, con the new conservative party in Canada is very against all climate action, they wanna kill carbon pricing. Um, we have uh, indigenous leaders, um, it was pretty awesome. And I think that is the Team Canada that I always hope to see um, when we do things internationally, but that's the approach we need to bring to climate. Uh, there's me and John Kerry, very sad. He's stepping down. I mean, he really has put in his time. Did anyone read, there was a, apparently an interview with David Wallace Wells and him this morning. I haven't read it, it's supposed to be very good. It's in the New York Times, check it out. But John Kerry did a lot. He pushed really hard. I mean, sometimes the American position was annoying, but he always was there to try to cajole people and get people to do things. And that started far before uh, you know, the Paris Agreement. 
These are all the women. There's so many women. There were many more women, but these are some of the women. And it was just really great to actually, it wasn't like we're going to do women for the sake of women. It was actually who's really ambitious. And it happened to be a lot of those awesome women. That's the High Ambition Coalition. Tony Nabrum sadly passed away. If you were a part of it, you got this banana leaf, I think, that he, they had made. And we thought we were super cool. Then we went in. I think I'm behind that. But we all went in arm in arm and everyone was cheering. And you realize like a country like Marshall Islands in a system like the UN system actually matters. Because that's why groups of big countries like G20s, it's not represented there. So they can't tell you that they're going to be underwater at 1.5 degrees. So they were really the moral compass uh, of the Paris Agreement. And this I just love because this is the gav uh, gavel. Um, I got this from Laurent Fabius. So... Um, okay, what did I learn? Uh, what did I learn in politics, both domestically and internationally? Climate's the thing. The thing is the thing, and the thing is climate change. This is from my team. They were like, you always say that. And I was like, yeah, I do, because the thing is the thing, and the thing is climate change. What do I mean by that? I was one minister. I was minister of environment and climate change. Like, you can't tackle climate change just as the minister of environment and climate change. In fact, it makes you very unpopular. Like, people like wanted to kill me and I was climate Barbie and all these things, but some people actually didn't want to kill me. Good, bad, but because you're doing regulation. Regulation is really not the most popular thing, but spending money, quite popular, as we've seen with the Inflation Reduction Act. So uh, you need the Minister of Finance, you need the Minister of Infrastructure, you need the Minister of Transportation, because you gotta be thinking about how you're reducing your emissions. You need basically every single minister. So if we don't think about climate as the thing, you actually have policies that aren't consistent. Like right now, to be honest, our Department of Finance, our Ministry of Finance in Canada is not as aligned as it should be. So we don't have a green taxonomy to drive the trillion, the, to drive the you know, massive investment we need to see in our country. So you really do need everyone to be aligned. And it, sometimes people think about climate as like one thing, like they're like, it's an environmental thing. Well, actually, it's a national security thing. It's a uh, social justice thing. It's a economic risk, a financial risk. It's also an economic driver. It's a jobs thing. It's an indigenous thing. It's an everything thing. So you can get a cup like that too. Just remind yourself, you probably all know that because you're at the climate school. Uh, do the big things that matter. Um, so on climate, it's quite weird because you're like, I have to do everything. Emissions, like we had charts and we would be like emissions across sectors and then we'd be like looking at everything. <laughs> the reality is you got to go for scale. Scale is the most important thing. You got to do everything, yes, but you got to figure out where your big uh, win's going to come from. And I think sometimes we get distracted in the climate world, and I will say that is all of us, on all of us, that sometimes we're like very focused on one little thing or winning. Like often actually in the climate world, people are fighting each other on like things, and I'm like, guys, guys, like the big thing, emissions need to go down now, money needs to go up now uh, from fossil fuels to clean, and we need to ensure a just transition. Those are the things. Like, yes, many things have to happen, but you gotta keep your eye on the game. Uh, so the big thing in Canada uh, was getting carbon pricing. It was really, really, really hard. Uh, and a lot of people fought it, um, conservatives fought it, and we won at the Supreme Court, but it is very at risk um, in the next election. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister is not very popular, and we are at some point headed to an election, and if the Conservatives win, they have said the first thing they will do is ax the tax, is actually just, any lawyers here? You guys look like you're very diligent. It's not actually a carbon tax because it's revenue neutral. We give all the money back. The Supreme Court said this. I'm very into this because that was important, and George Schultz, you guys know who George Schultz was? Secretary of State under Ronald Reagan. I spent a lot of time talking to conservatives and Republicans about how to do this, and he said, you gotta give all the money back. Very, 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 very important. I had to fight internally our government because progressives often want to like, just spend money on things. And I was like, we're not doing spend things. We're not spending money on things. We're giving the money back to people, and it's gonna be transparent, and all the money is gonna go back so that I have an amount. I can say that how much each family, you know, an average family of four got because we needed to show that we were serious and people were getting more money back because they would pay at the pump. So you needed to be able to have that narrative. Um, this is a fossil fuel crisis. Yes, there are other things that cause climate change, but 80% of this is caused by the burning of fossil fuels. And this is the problem. Like, okay, 
I'm a realist in life. I tried to work with fossil fuel companies. I tried. I tried. I had so many meetings. I sat with them. I listened to them. They said all these things. Then they would leave, and then they go tell finance, "Don't do anything. Your your environment minister's crazy. Like you know, whatever. Like then they fought us on everything from like heat pumps to plastic bags, and environmental assessments, and of course, a cap on emissions from oil and gas. Like everything they fought us on. So it's over. This is a fossil fuel climate crisis and we need to be focused on that. In Canada, they spend a lot of time telling us they're part of the solution. I was like, oh, that's really interesting because let's just look at the facts. The facts is you are making record profits. Like you're making gobs of money, not because you're brilliant because of an illegal war caused by, you know, a legal evasion of Ukraine by Russia. That's largely why you're making it. I know that there are some other reasons, but that's actually largely why, not geniuses. Two, that money is going back largely to your shareholders. And in Canada, they're not even Canadian. They're taking all those profits. They're not investing in scale and clean. They're giving it back to shareholders. Then what are they doing? They're demanding subsidies. Demanding subsidies for CCS to clean up their own pollution. They're asking Canadian taxpayers to pay for things they won't even do. And by the way, I'm not totally against CCS. I've just heard the story about CCS for like 20 years. Every time I hear CCS, I hear, oh, let's not do anything now and talk about a solution that has never been shown at scale or at cost. That's what I hear. I hear not 2030, 2035, 2040. That's what I hear. That's what I hear. And I hear, I don't care about the burning of fossil fuels, which is actually the biggest part of the problem. Um, and then it's a fossil fuel climate crisis. Layered on that in Canada, actually, people are paying a lot for heating oil and gas. Why are they paying a lot for heating oil? The people try to say it's carbon pricing. Carbon pricing is revenue and usually all the money goes back. They are paying more for heating oil and gas because oil and gas companies are charging more for heating oil and gas. That's what's happening. So we just have to remember this. And I say this because it makes me slightly sad that some of you, like I get life. In life, you gotta get jobs. And I saw this with some of the people who worked with me. You gotta find a job and then you're working for a fossil fuel company, or you're working for a management consulting firm that's helping a fossil fuel company, or a comms firm that's helping spread misinformation, disinformation, actually lies sometimes, fossil companies, like, it matters. It matters that we actually do this. And as I say, I wish that we had not entrenched interests and that everyone was just like, oh, climate crisis, we gotta just tackle it, like, that's the thing. That's not what's happening. So I've become very hardened on this. Um, and people are like, chill. I was like, yeah, chill, chill. What's the temperature outside right now? Yeah, okay, I'm not chill, not chill. So, I don't know. That's why people have to draw lines. That's my line. Um, draw, this is another line, because actually literally this is a red line. <laughs> draw a red line around greenwashing. Um, so I was asked by the UN Secretary General, who really is no Fs on climate. <laughs> if you've seen his comms, he is really probably not supposed to say that, but. Um, he, uh, he really calls it out and he said, you know what, would you do uh, lead an expert group and would you actually talk about, like set real criteria? Like when we say net zero, 90% of the, of the global GDP is covered by net zero targets, what does it actually require? Because people are all net zero, but why is then, why aren't we tackling climate change? So we did this report, it was experts around the world, and it wasn't just environmentalists. Yeah, we had an environmentalist. We also had the former governor of the Bank of China. We also had a former head of state. We also had a scientist. We also had a business leader. Like we had, we had folks, it was gender balance, which was my criteria, but it was also global south and uh, developed countries. And, we came up with only 10 recommendations because I work in three or 10 and we had 10 and it's very clear about what is required. And I think that's really important that there is a price of admission. If you want to say that you're amazing, then you got to be doing the work. Um, essentially, it means you got to reduce your emissions now um, in line with uh, being uh, reducing emissions, global emissions in half by 2030. So you need science-based long-term target, but you also need interim targets. You need to have a transition plan. You need a plan. Businesses are used to plans. That's not like a new thing, but you have to have a plan. Um, ideally, you also have executive compensation incentives aligned, um, and that includes your CapEx, because money needs to go from dirty to clean at scale now. Um, you need to report transparently and with comparable data so people can actually understand. Um, what can you not do? You cannot uh, just buy cheap credits rather than reducing your own emissions. You cannot uh, invest in new fossil fuel infrastructure. That's not me. That is actually the International Energy Agency. That is the UNFCCC. That is the science. 
Um, and you cannot lobby against climate action. You should be lobbying for climate action. If you are net zero, you by definition, you probably need government policy. So you should be lobbying for the government policy you need, not telling everyone behind doors like not to listen to the environment minister. Um, and so that uh, I think is really important because we can actually drive this. If you look today, there should be a report. I will tweet it out. Uh, there should be some media around this, but I just did an event with large asset owners. So BNP Paribas, uh, the New York City controller, Brad Lander, um, Tomasic, uh, which is basically Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund, a bunch of other big asset owners. So this is money. They uh, did a, a, a report that I think is awesome. It's about showing how the best practices align with each of our criteria, which I think is important because we saw a bunch of uh, asset managers leave Climate 100 uh, a few weeks ago. And so the narrative is the world is moving. And by the way, climate risk is real risk, it's financial risk. So you need to actually look at the financial risk and the financial opportunity, and there are people who are doing this. And I think this narrative is more important than ever because I think in the US it's a very different conversation than you may have in other places. You may feel like no one's doing anything, it's all bad. No, actually, people are rational. Like, there's a real cost of climate change. And there's Mark Carney, a Canadian, who you may know, former governor of the Bank of Canada, then governor of the Bank of England, said there's gonna be a Minsky moment. If we don't get our act together, like there's gonna be, we're gonna go off a cliff. And guess what's gonna to happen to financial markets, right? That's gonna be terrible. Instead, we can actually figure this out, but we gotta do the work. Um, get things built. <coughs> Good news, the IRA is on this. You have to build things. It is true. Sustainable infrastructure is extremely important, and that is hard, because I was Minister of Infrastructure, uh, we need to get things built. And that doesn't mean you don't have to care about other <laughs> consequences, but we need to figure out ways. Transmission lines are super <laughs> important if we're gonna clean up our grids. grids. But all sorts of, you know, the, the, the sustainable infrastructure pieces, and that's a real opportunity because infrastructure actually, every dollar you spend on infrastructure has massive returns, including pure economic returns. Tackle disinformation, yes! Gosh, probably right now trending climate scam. It's probably like Catherine McKenna climate scam or something exciting. But uh, we got a huge problem. Disinformation, misinformation online is really bad. And we are actually seeing that having an impact on people's belief on whether climate change is man-made, including in Canada. We're pretty reasonable people. And so I think we're gonna have to figure this out. I think we need to hold uh, social media companies accountable for many things, including the hate that they spread online. Canada just has a new online hate bill. Um, but we're gonna have to tackle this because people need to understand the science. If we're gonna act on reason, we need to understand the, the science behind climate change and how it's accelerating. Need to talk like pe real people talk. Hopefully you feel like I talk like real people talk. I try. Because <laughs> um, I think one of the things that is very disenabling or disempowering for people is when they hear people that are smart people on climate talking about it like with all these acronyms and about things they don't know, like even net zero. Do you think a regular person has any idea what net zero means? Like the net of zero and what year in 2050? Like they don't really know. They do know clean air. They do know clean water. They do know like when there's air pollution and their kids can't go play soccer. Like there are ways of talking about climate that probably are way closer. They know about jobs. The other things that we need to make sure that we're emphasizing while we're still doing the work, but I think we could probably all use a lot less acronyms in the climate world and also really focus on people. When we talk about things, talk about what people, talk about the way people talk, but talk about the things people care about. That doesn't mean technical reports have to do that, but you better have your, your executive summary in a way that people can, can actually relate to it. Uh, make pinky promises. So. So when I saw my job, I was like, oh gosh, this is a very, very hard job. I have all these different people who want all these different things, and they lobby government, and you know, we have less lobbying in the US, but we still have a lot of lobbying. And I realized, okay, you know who doesn't get to lobby me are young people, so I'm gonna do pinky promises. So I did thousands of pinky promises with young people, and what did every single young person say? It actually makes me kind of emotional, they're like, you gonna save our planet. Like, that's what they all said. Like, they all said, like, you're a minister. Like, I don't know, are you gonna do things? And what's amazing about that, it was a reminder, because I go sit in meetings and everyone tell me why we couldn't do things. It's so hard, we can't do it, too expensive. And I never got to hear from the young kid who said, what are you talking about? Like, what future am I gonna have? And I realized, like, I would often think about that 
And it also supersedes politics, because I've left politics. No one can lobby me now, I don't care. Don't, lobby, don't bother lobbying me. But I still owe those kids. And it is a reminder, like that is what it is about. I have three kids, but it's about the future. Like sometimes if you talk to kids, it's so bonkers. You're, you're like, and young people, like you're like, what the hell's going on? Like why is everyone so like not just understanding what's going on? And I think it is a reality check. And then people are like, oh, everyone's so unrealistic. I'm like, no. What we are lacking is realism amongst like the adult population. Like, what are we doing? We have the solutions. <laughs> we can scale the solutions, but we are constantly finding reasons why we can't do things. And often, maybe it's because I'm from the hammer, or maybe because I'm a competition lawyer, but I'm like, often the solutions that we can't do are enabling big business to make more money. Like, it's not helping, like, you know, regular people. And I think it is really important that we just remember that, that sometimes we get into all these technical discussions about things, yeah, sure, you gotta figure things out, you gotta do things in a smart way. But we have to stop thinking about why, how we can't do things and how hard it is and thinking about how we're just gonna plow through and do them. Empower women and tackle misogyny. Well, I say this because I have a special place in my heart. People used to send me Barbies. I was climate Barbie. They weren't sending them because they loved me. They were sending me Barbies because they were like, you're like Barbie. I guess like, I was like, first of all, I never played with Barbies and my mom wouldn't let me. She was like, that is not cool. You're not playing with Barbies. So I wasn't like into Barbies. So I was kind of annoyed. I didn't say anything for a very long time because people would like think it was so hilarious. They'd go on social media. And, and then one day I was at the UN <laughs> and it had been a long time. And my team, they were lovely. They were like, don't engage. They'll think you're weak. And I was hanging out with leaders, come home to my hotel. We're sitting in the lobby of kind of a crappy hotel. And I look and my Twitter has exploded. And I realized that one of my colleagues in the House of Commons, a former minister, I'd done some like super condescending Barbie tweet. And I was like, sorry. I said to my team, I was like, sorry, I just have to deal with this right now. So I'm like, Tch -tch -tch. but luckily I'm a lawyer, so I'm not completely bonkers. So I was like, oh, would you use that kind of language with your wife, girlfriend, sister? You're not chasing us out of politics or stopping us on climate. And it was interesting because actually the reaction of Canadians was amazing. They were like, yeah, what a jerk. And that actually is important, because it was an important lesson to me. I was like, oh, you can sometimes call things out. Like, I'm not gonna do it every day, because if I did it every day, it's been every day, minute of every day. And I'm not in politics now, so I don't have to care. But at that point, it actually was important. I mean, my kids kind of thought it funny. They're like, well, Barbie went to the moon. I was like, that is not the message. That guy is <laughs> he's not saying like, oh, Catherine McKenna is so amazing. Go to the moon with Catherine McKenna. Um, so I do think we need to call it misogyny. And by the way, like I make light of it, but actually it wasn't that funny after a while because I got personal attacks. People, they wrote the C word on my office, but I had people coming to my house. So like I had to have security. So that was not good. And I'm very lucky because I had access to security if I needed it. There are a lot of politicians like local counselors or people who are out there taking stances or activists in the community who don't have action, they don't have access to security. It's very, very dangerous and even more so in less developed countries in the global south. So we need to tackle this. Um, and climate denial, misogyny, that's a, the circles are very close. Find your allies. I think this is important because I was like, okay, there's a lot going on in the US. This is very reminiscent potentially of uh, 2016. Um, so these, this is Minister Xia. So he was the climate negotiator from China. That's Miguel Cañete. He was the negotiator from, uh, from Europe and that's me. Um, and this was after COP, this was after the US election. And I was like, I hadn't been minister for very long, but I was like, okay, I need to keep the momentum going. How am I gonna get a climate plan in Canada? Because everyone's gonna talk about competitiveness with the US. So they're gonna say, do nothing. So I was like, okay, we gotta move forward, we gotta move forward. So I said, well, why don't we just show that the world is moving forward? So there used to be the major, well, there still is, major, economy, major economies forum run by the US. We created the Ministerial Climate Action. And so that was Canada, the US, China coming together. And, um, it was really useful because we just showed the whole world is not gonna fall apart because of a change of one government. Also in the US, we're all in, that was the corporates, financial institutions, cities and regions, extremely important. So remember that. Hopefully there will be a very good outcome and we will have someone in the president's, <laughs> in someone who's president here who believes in climate action and is gonna continue going. But if we don't, the world is gonna keep on moving forward. And cities, regions, corporates, financial institutions will too. 
okay, I'm at the very end of this. Um, so I know people, someone asked me like, okay, how do we have hope here and what are we doing? Um, so this was post, this was written at the beginning of the year with Laurence Tubiana, who is my great mentor and is awesome. And um, I didn't want to do, I was like, they wanted us to do so like what happened to this cop. I was like, everyone has written about what happened. It was the most amazing transformational, worst ever. Like what I, I was like, I don't even care what happened, whatever. All that matters is what are we doing next? And we need to figure out how do we make the end of fossil fuels real? Like that is the only thing I care about every day. That is what I think about because that is what was a fossil fuel climate crisis. Um, so one, implement the IEA pathway by 2030. This actually has the solutions. It's not that hard. We need to scale wind and solar. That is a thing that we need to do. We need to, uh, we need to tackle methane. We can tackle methane and oil and gas. We actually have the solutions. Um, we have many other solutions, heat pumps. CCS is not a 2030 solution. There are a lot of solutions that aren't 2030. That doesn't mean other people can't invest in them, but 2030, we need to actually reduce emissions by half. We need to phase out fossil fuels. Yes, there are many ways we talk about how to do that. There are different ways we're going to do that, including suing fossil fuel companies and anyone around them, so they get very scared. People get very scared about being sued. Tobacco is an example, I would say. Um, we need to scale up capital and to build renewable energy systems. We mean, need to make the tripling of renewables real. Uh, bring accountability to net zero commitments, actually hold people to their commitments. That'll make a huge difference and empower people. And empower people, there's a lot in that. Empowering people includes like working with the Pope and the Laudato Si movement and green churches because we need to use uh, different ways to reach people. The health community, when I was working on climate, we had the doctors, um, uh, the Canadian physicians uh, for the environment, but we need to use health as a way into people. We need to do climate assemblies. We need to have young people in positions where they can influence governments so they're actually structured. And there are many things that we can do because we need to move away from countries and make it now about real people who want change. Because it's too much up here, elections, you know what, governments will break your heart. Sometimes the government that I was part of breaks my heart. Like, that's the way it is. But people are real, and people believe, and people want action. And so we need to empower that action in a much more systemic way. So that is something I think about a lot. And uh, I am a stubborn climate optimist. That is actually, I think, something that Columbia put out. So I don't know, maybe you guys can make a bunch of these t-shirts and give it to everyone at the climate school. That was at COP26. I'd finished being a minister, I did an event with the climate school and I thought that was a good little display they made. Okay, I went over sadly, but questions, should I just, do you wanna take questions? Have any questions? Um, and please wait <laughs> and for a mic. There were dumb questions, I asked what is a cop, like that was pretty much the stupidest question, I could have Googled it, but. There's a sucks. mic over there. Um, hi, Minister McKenna, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, my name is Ben and I'm a second year student at uh, the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, I'm also Canadian and I remember that during your tenure as minister, um, there were uh, quite a few uh, difficult moments in Canada when it came to approving pipeline infrastructure um, and um, I guess a lot of debates raging over uh, how do we as a country which uh, is very much endowed by natural resources and um, by oil and gas um, decide on how, how to build out our pipeline capacity? How does that have to do with um, reconciliation with indigenous peoples, uh, land rights and all that? And I guess the, the, the liberal government said no to several pipelines for a number of reasons um, and yet when Ukraine was invaded full scale in 2022, um, a lot of um, a lot of European diplomats came asking for, uh, an, I guess, an LNG uh, export facility on Canada's east coast. Um, so, give, given all this trouble, I was, I was wondering whether you could speak to the debates today that are going on with regards to that, and then also the fact that some Indigenous communities today are investing in oil and gas infrastructure in Canada, and how should we as a country reconcile our climate ambitions with our goals with reconciliation, uh, knowing very well that Indigenous communities in Canada aren't a monolith and have different approaches to dealing with climate change? Thank you. So that, there's a lot, and that's, the, that's like a lot of really smart questions. So, hmm. 
And there's like, that's probably a long answer. So we approved a pipeline. Does anyone know that? Greta tweeted about it, I cried. Because <laughs> we did a climate emergency the next day. We either did a climate emergency the day before or the day after. I was like, no, like people are reasonable. Jean Chrétien said that. He was our prime minister. I was like, this is not reasonable. No one's gonna think it was reasonable. Um, and when I look back, it, first of all, it was a terrible economic decision. It's like, how many times over? I, we have an economist here. It's like six or eight times over. So it was like, just government should probably never own pipelines. Just as a general fact, forget the climate impacts. Um, but why did we do it? We did it because of what you were talking about. We did it because we were working with an Alberta NDP government. So that's our left, left of Liberal Party, center, conservatives, right? NDP. So we had a government in Alberta that was actually committed to climate action. But they said if we didn't approve that pipeline, which they saw as critical to getting their product to market, they, they had pulled out of our climate plan. I think they said that they were not going to implement pricing. So that is what happened. I mean, I was minister. So there are very different views expressed at a cabinet table, I'll tell you that. Um, I'm a team player and I'm reasonable. So I was like, not great. In retrospect, I think it was a terrible decision. It was very hard for me to say that. Because, the, but the problem was we were trying to do things for the right reason. We thought that that would bring Alberta on board. What happened? We got a conservative government that fought us tooth and nail on anything. So sometimes when you're trying to do the right thing, you get a bit confused because you, you think if you do one thing, you're gonna get an outcome that is actually a good outcome, except the problem is it's a very bad outcome when it comes to, to climate. And I'm, not, I'm a realist about this is a transition, but look at where we're at. We're so far from where we need to be. And I worry about Canada a bit because we're the fourth largest exporter now of oil and gas. And I don't know that we understand that. Like we're so focused with our target in Canada, which is extremely hard to make only because of oil and gas. Everyone else has reduced their emissions. It's 27% of our emissions and going up. That we forget actually that, that the forest fires that we've got, the wildfires, by the way, the, did I already talk about this? Wildfires are burning right now. Like we're already got the fires going. It's gonna be quite a summer probably. Um, that's not disconnected by decisions about pipelines, which we kind of think it is in a weird way because our brains aren't, don't work like that. So. That is a thing. On the indigenous piece, it's very complex, right? Like, it is complex. And I had to redo environmental assessments fought by oil and gas companies because they didn't like that at the front end. I said, you cannot just go. We had to rebuild trust in, in environmental assessments. I said, you can't just go and put a big box of stuff on a desk, um, like massive boxes to indigenous communities and say, okay, here's the project, you want it or not. You can't influence it, you just take it or leave it. And by the way, you're not gonna get an interest, you'll get, maybe get a job or two, and then it'll have huge impacts. So we redid environmental assessments, but I will just say, of course, reconciliation is absolutely critical. But there always in politics are gonna be different things you have to think about. An environmental assessment is an environmental assessment. Of course you consider indigenous communities, but you have to consider the environment and the social, like the broader socioeconomic impacts. So there's no, I think we have to be very careful. And of course indigenous communities are very different, but even for example, in areas where you have some communities that want development, often you have other communities who don't. And it's often used like, oh, you guys hate development. You don't care about indigenous reconciliation. I'm like, hmm, that is probably not exactly the story. But I think, in the end, we're gonna to have to figure it out, but the one thing I don't think we can do is we can't always be making compromises. And by the way, making compromises has not helped us in Canada. It didn't get governments who suddenly loved Justin Trudeau and what we were doing on climate. In fact, they attacked us even more. And we were so worried that we were creating a national unity crisis. We're like, if this pipeline, if we do this, do this, and it didn't, it didn't matter. So I don't know, I'm a little bit tough and tougher on this now. Like, don't think that you can do one thing and influence a whole bunch of other things. Having said that, you gotta to talk to real people like real people. And we didn't do enough, uh, I think, investing in infrastructure in those communities, really investing in jobs. We passed bills called the Sustainable Just Transition Jobs Act. Like, no one thinks government's creating jobs. They think you're gonna kill them and never get them another job, right? Like, we should be very thoughtful. But we have to be careful about making concessions. We don't have a lot of time here to fool around with. And if we constantly say, well, if we just do this, we just do Willow, we just do this, like, where do we end up? We are not ending up at 1.5 degrees. That doesn't mean it's easy, and it doesn't mean that we, you know, the, it's very different politics than 2015. 
but I don't know. Climate's the, the thing is the thing. <laughs> it's just an everything thing. Um, that is probably an unsatisfactory answer, but there are no satisfactory answers on those questions. They're very hard. Can we go a bit over? I have no idea what happens here. Okay. And if we want to take multiple questions, I can be shorter. I'll try. Hi. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Uh, my name is Shade. I'm from this climate school. Um, so as you said, it's a no-brainer that we need to phase out fossil fuel to stay uh, as close as possible to <laughs> 1.5. Uh, but there's many countries, like lower, lower income countries, that uh, need to develop, that want to use fossil fuels to reach a certain level of prosperity. And we know that the culprit is climate finance, like we need finance to, to, to build like, sustainable energy. Uh, so in your years in COPs, have you seen those conversations about finance to develop clean energy in low income countries gain traction? Uh, have you seen more talks around that? And what do you, how do you think we can make progress on this? Yeah, I mean, this is a million, actually, it's a trillion dollar question. Um, yeah, I mean, it always is brought up and it's always fall short. And this will be the one thing that will really be the biggest challenge, I think, in terms of the international consensus on climate. If we do not find money to support uh, the global south. Now, I will make one point, because I do think I do try to do, say some things, because I sometimes I hear, and that's, I'm not saying this is what you say, but I, I hear from like oil and gas companies, you, you want to keep people like in the dark ages. Most of these oil and gas companies don't say, I'd like to go to a poor community in Africa and develop it for the benefit of that community. They take the <laughs> gas and export it. Nigeria, perfect example. So I, it, like, there are distributed energy, solar, wind, but the problem is those cost money. And by the way, a lot of people are often in coal jobs, so people lose jobs. So. That money needs to happen, and I, we talk about this in the in the op-ed, and um, one of the areas, like, there's no more money from governments. Governments should put in a lot more money, by the way, but there probably is not going to be more money, a lot more money. And so where are your other money? Blended finance. So how do we bring the private sector? Everyone in the private sector always tells us there's trillions of dollars, but then there are no projects. And like, I've sat in those conversations. It's hard to imagine, like, I wish someone, I was just like, you guys are really smart. I'm not like a finance person, solve it. Like, go figure out the projects, go do some work, figure out, like, maybe. So now there's a lot of talk, and Laurence Tubiana is working on this, and France is working with Barbados, and in Kenya, I believe, on international taxation. Literally tax the people <laughs> that are the heavy emitters. And we're not talking about damages here, we're actually talking about paying for the cost of your pollution. Basic conservative principle, it shouldn't be free to pollute. So if you are a heavy emitter, if you are oil and gas, if you are shipping, if you are aviation or whatever, there's a tax. Complicated to administer, although there is a financial transaction tax. So I think there are, that is probably the most, as I look, like the most realistic way. I don't know. It's not an easy road. But I agree with you that when I talk to folks in the global south, like they're like, oh, okay, of course. Like we're being impacted more than anyone else by climate change, but are you going to help us get this transition because you're rich. And by the way, Canada, you're still like shipping out oil and gas. And then you're like, but we got to phase out of fossil fuels. So there is a real disconnect and we have to solve that. I think maybe we're aware, but I don't know that we're finding the solutions. And it's going to come to a head because if people want new nationally determined contributions next year, the pre quid pro quo will be money <laughs> for uh, developed country, developing countries. That was a very not fast answer. So these are hard questions, though. They're very good questions. Yeah, hi. Uh, related to that, sorry, my name is Ariane. I'm a master's student at SEPA slash the climate school, um, also part Canadian. Uh, yeah, you know, talking about the influence of Canada on other economies and sort of the extractivism that kind of happens, you know, with companies going into places like Nigeria and doing all of this extracting, uh, whether it's energy or mining, all these different industries. Have you ever been in these conversations with, because a lot of these culprits, unfortunately, are Canadian, you know, have you ever been in conversations with these types of companies? And what do you typically do to try and pressure them not to, you know, go into a place, um, take out all the resources without giving back to the local economy, while at the same time not necessarily benefiting Canadian citizens either, as you mentioned about the whole shareholder issue. Um, like, what are your tactics for there? That so unfortunately, issue? I didn't. I mean, I worked on that more when I had this. When we ran Canadian Lords Broad, we would provide advice to you know folks that were in those countries who were looking at taking action. Because the focus as minister often is on what are folks doing domestically, and we already had a lot of issues when it came to mining and uh, oil and gas development, same thing. Um, so 
it is a real problem. And uh, I know in Canada, the government tried to bring in some criteria that would apply abroad, and then like I think the committee all fell apart because <laughs> um, they felt that it wasn't robust enough. And I think this is the one thing that, you know, sometimes I do think like you need a mirror, <laughs> that sometimes Canadians and Americans too, and uh, like even Norway, which is doing amazing things in its own country, I mean, still exporting a lot of fossil fuels, that we need to actually really think about like are we, are we doing what we need to do? It's interesting because Mulroney, so Prime Minister Mulroney, he passed away, um, and he had a saying. Now, I won't say he always did it, but he had a saying, you gotta have clean hands. So he was able to get a deal on acid rain with the Americans, he was able to get a deal, the Montreal Protocol, to tackle, um, to tackle the whole neozone layer, and it was because Canada was actually doing things, so when they went to Americans, we said, like, we gotta do it. Now, we had to keep on going for years and years and years, and like Ronald Reagan didn't believe, and he didn't believe that, uh, that uh, acid rain was a problem, and so like, in, and the ozone hole, he didn't think it was caused man-made, but we got there, and, and I think it is important, right? Like, how can you go tell other people what you gotta do if you actually don't have clean hands in yourself? But that is very hard, the extraterritoriality, they're all like, you know, and these are big companies, right? But often on the mining side, often it's actually the smaller players that are worse, but yeah, I don't have a solution for that. You should work on it, <laughs> solve it.